Uh, I define the physical region in a uh, general sense as simply demanding that the external form momentum be all real. For a scattering process, I define a scattering amplitude, which is a function of two variables, by forcing the, all the external momentum to be on the mass shell. Therefore, the physical region for a scattering process is where all the momenta are real and on the mass shell. Um, are there other questions? Uh, I'd like to have a, uh, a brief discussion of uh, what we're going to talk about in the rest of this course. I think we have three and a half, we are four weeks until our reading period ends. Is that right? I'm going to give the exam, of course, the same as last time, the last weekend in reading period, with options of taking it a little bit earlier or a little bit later, if you wish, of course. Um, and um, I was thinking about things. I um, wanted to... Uh, uh, talk about uh, a current algebra. That's a natural next topic. I won't go into the huge details. There are gigantic books, but I can give the same sort of brief survey I've given. I am in the process of giving of analyticity methods. And um, I thought there would probably be enough time left to do a little something about non-abelian gauge field theories and spontaneous symmetry breakdown. There was some reluctance at uh, the beginning of the course when I talked with some students about covering that material because they said, oh, at Hoft is giving a course on it. But at Hoft's lectures are on a very advanced level, and perhaps people would appreciate a more elementary discussion. Is, that, is there some topic dear to the heart of someone in this class? Uh, Kay, yes. Asymptotic freedom. Asymptotic freedom. I may not have time. If I have time, I will. But I've got to do the non-abelian gauge theories first to do asymptotic freedom, and I can't do I can't do uh, non-abelian. I can't. Sorry, I can't. There's no point in doing non-abelian gauge theories without doing spontaneous symmetry breakdown because then you'll ask, what on earth do they have to do with the real world? Yeah. Connected with asymptotic freedom. I don't know if I will be able to go at a breakneck enough pace to cover both. Should I sacrifice current algebra? Oh, you all want to see the Adler-Weisberger relation, surely, and the goldberger tremont relation. Well, yeah. um, anybody that wants to learn how current algebra can get a few long individuals class, uh, we can interact with you doing that now. Mm. Let me, how many weeks do I, let me, I'll work out with the catalog how many weeks I have left and see whether I, whether I will begin lecturing on current algebra next week and devote a week or a week and a half to that, or whether I will begin lecturing immediately on spontaneous symmetry breakdown. Now, uh, last lecture, I, there was one thing I forgot to tell you, you must have all known it, since uh, you, nobody called me on it. The proton, of course, has a spin. So when we're considering pi plus p forward scattering, you might say, what do you, what do you have to only talk about one amplitude? Aren't there four amplitudes depending on the two values of the initial proton spin and the two values of the final proton spin? Well, of course, by the conservation of angular momentum, since the moment in proton, in the sense, <coughs> the, um, if we consider the initial proton and pion as going along the z-axis, and since we're in the forward, forward scattering, the final proton and pion are also, by Jz conservation, the, uh, a the amplitude must preserve the direction of the, fo of the proton spin, because that's the only angular momentum in the problem. And uh, by parity, it must be the same. For the th that gives us two possible cases where in the center of mass frame the proton has positive helicity or whether it has negative helicity. But of course, they're exchanged by parity, and the strong interactions are parity invariant, so there's really only one amplitude. And therefore, there's really only one cross-section. The cross total cross-section for an initial helicity plus one half proton is the same as the total cross-section for an initial helicity minus one half proton is the same as the total cross-section averaged over helicities. So although I didn't give you that little song and dance last lecture when I should have because I was in such terrible shape last Tuesday, uh, it doesn't, it, uh, the spin is really just factors out of the problem and is totally irrelevant. Now let me summarize where we had got to last lecture. We had defined I 
minus p, sigma plus and minus was the total cross section for pi plus p, pi minus p. We had uh, the optical theorem. equals twice the center of mass momentum of either of the two particles, the center of mass energy times the total cross-section, a useful device. We have to find a kinematic variable nu equals 2p dot q, where p is the proton momentum and q is the pion momentum. And we have deduced from experiment and fragment Lindelof type arguments that enable us to bound the function in the complex plane, if we can bound it along the cuts, that A minus over nu obeys an unsubtracted dr in nu squared, where it only has a right-hand cut and a pole to the nucleon. And uh, so does a plus over nu squared. So that, of course, has an extra pole at nu squared equals 0, or equivalently, a plus itself obeys a uh, one subtracted dispersion relation. Now, <clears throat> in this lecture, which is going to be occupied primarily with very dull kinematics, I am going to uh, explicitly write down these dispersion relations. All of the machinery is on the board, uh, except for the computation of the pole terms, which, of course, we can do from lowest order perturbation theory by our renormalization conditions. But let's first kinematic step is to get the optical theorem in terms of nu. That's very dull, but I'll do it. There's going to be some more dull kinematics about partial wave amplitudes. Um, P in the center of mass frame is an energy times a momentum. P plus Q is square root of S zero. Uh, that's the definition of what it means to be in the center of mass frame. And therefore, um, nu is 2p dot, um, sorry, wrong way. Let me get it straight. Root s times root p squared plus m squared is p times p plus q is m squared plus nu over 2. So therefore, squaring both sides, we have sp squared plus sm squared. Using the fact that sp squared plus s is p plus q squared, so that's m squared plus mu squared plus nu times m squared equals m to the fourth plus m squared nu plus one quarter nu squared. We see many terms cancel in this equation. The m fourth term cancels the m fourth term here. The m squared uh, new term here cancels the m squared new term here. And we can write <coughs> the thing that appears in the optical theorem, or I should say whose square appears in the optical theorem, 4sp squared equals nu squared minus 4 m squared nu squared. Just to check that we haven't made any algebraic errors with our numerical factors, when uh, the pion is at rest in this relative to the proton, its energy is mu, so nu is uh, 2m mu. And uh, then, of course, the left-hand side vanishes, and the right-hand side vanishes also. So uh, I haven't, I've kept my, uh, at least these two things are in the right ratio, whether they have the right overall sign, you have to 
believe my algebra. Uh, thus, the optical theorem is considerably simplified. And I'll write it down here. Imaginary part of A plus or minus, this is, of course, the imaginary part above the cut in the physical region, is square root of nu squared minus 4 m squared times sigma plus or minus. Okay, any questions about that? <clears throat> now, the, um, if there are no questions, I will erase this kinematics, and so we don't need it anymore. Oops, was there someone going to ask a question? Forward. This is forward. The kinematics would be very different at, uh, well, the optical theorem wouldn't be true for any fixed angle other than zero. <laughs> now, let's remind our, let me remind you of the general form of an unsubtracted dispersion relation. Suppose I have some complex variable x, and I have something that says, say, has a single pole at the point x naught, and a cut beginning at x1. The unsubtracted dispersion relation and the physical value of the thing is the value above the cut, f of x. Then the unsubtracted dispersion relation says f of x equals r, the residue at the pole, over x minus x naught, sum of such terms if there are several poles, plus integral x1 to infinity, 1 over pi dx, imaginary part x prime, the imaginary part of f of x prime, uh, x prime minus x minus i epsilon. That gives us both the real and imaginary part of the function in the physically observable region, the region above the cut, in terms of uh, its imaginary part alone and the residue at the pole. That was an equation from a previous lecture, but actually, since people, there is some mysterious person who steals my notes whenever I, I worked it out afresh by doing a Cauchy integral, and you could do the same if you doubt me. Uh, now, we want to apply this in the first instance to a minus, and of course, the variable we are looking at is a new squared x is, the analog of x is nu squared. Because that's the variable in which there is only a right-hand cut. dx equals 2 nu d nu. Therefore, applying it to a minus over nu, The only pole, there is no pole at nu equals 0, despite the fact that we've divided by nu, because a minus is an odd function. We have a pole at, uh, uh, as I, at uh, s or u equivalently equals uh, m squared. That is to say, as I showed last time, nu equals mu squared. So there'll be a residue, which I'll call r minus of a pole, nu squared minus mu to the fourth. Then there'll be a 2 over pi, dragging out the 2, integral from the lower value of nu squared, which is in terms of nu, nu equals mu m, 2 mu m, to infinity, nu prime d nu prime. That's the dx prime sitting up there. The imaginary part of a minus over nu which is, along the top of the cut, square root nu prime squared minus 4 mu squ 4 m squared mu squared. 
sigma minus of nu prime over nu prime. Just divide out since nu prime is real along the region of integration. That's the imaginary part of a minus over nu prime. <coughs> over the denominator. New prime squared minus new squared minus i epsilon. Or multiplying by new a minus of new equals r minus new over new squared minus mu to the fourth plus 2 over pi times nu, integral from 2 mu m to infinity, d nu prime, square root of nu prime squared and minus 4 m squared mu squared, squared, sigma minus of nu prime, nu prime squared minus nu squared minus i epsilon. Uh, so I, we will shortly compute R minus from, from uh, the lowest order graph. Uh, why did I divide by nu here? Um, because it's the imaginary part of A minus over nu. Forget it, I okay. <laughs> I see. John, you should. I, am, I, am, I answer her questions, and you answer her non-questions. <laughs> <laughs> this would be, I, I would have a much better batting record on answers if you asked me all of them. <laughs> now, likewise, we do the, um, the same thing for a plus over nu squared. Uh, the only difference is over nu squared is that we have a pole at zero, whose, of course, residue we know, a plus of zero over uh, nu squared. We have a possibly different residue. We're going to have to compute it. R plus over nu squared minus mu to the fourth plus 2 over pi integral as before. And the object that appears is sigma plus of nu prime over nu prime squared, since we're looking at the amplitude over nu squared. Thus, multiplying out by nu squared, and now writing things in the um, out fully, I have a plus of nu equals a plus of zero, an unknown constant from this viewpoint, plus r plus nu squared over nu squared minus mu to the fourth, plus uh, 2 nu squared over pi, integral from 2 mu m to infinity, d nu prime, um, square root of um, nu prime squared minus 4 mu m, sigma minus nu prime squared minus nu squared minus i epsilon times nu prime, because I've divided by one more nu prime here. Sigma plus, thank you. Uh, oh, did I write 4 mu m? I didn't write it before. 4 m squared mu squared, huh? Yes, thank you. That would be dimensionally wrong if I had mu m. Okay. Is everyone? Uh, I mean, it's, it's dull. 
But after all, if you're ever going to compare it with experiment, you've better make sure you've got all the factors in the right place. Now, the remaining check is to, uh, the remaining part of the derivation is simply to compute r plus and r minus. and a, a pi plus p, and then um, compute, and then uh, get the pi minus p by crossing, and then make a plus and a minus. Uh, I got that. The first term, as we know, Well, I kept telling it to you on trust, but um, we now know it by the Landau rules. Is the only if you can cut the graph, short circuit the graph so that you have one nucleon in the middle. Whoops, and I did it just wrong for pi plus p, didn't I? Forgive me. So pi plus p, uh, pi plus and p cannot come together and make it anything. All that can happen is the p can emit a pi plus and become a neutron. This is a proton. This is a pi plus proton. This is a pi plus coming in. This is a neutron. And this is a proton. A pi plus and a p, if they can't, the one I originally drew, and drew would have given us a doubly charged particle in the middle, which there ain't at, at least not at, not with mass of nucleon. Um, <laughs> the, um, hmm, and therefore I may have done it wrong because I may have written down the wrong graph. Yes, I did it. I wrote, ha, ah, I'm going to have a sign error. People who study these notes, I'll do it right here, but there'll be a sign error in the, uh, in the written version of the notes. Uh, no, I'm doing it for pi plus p throughout, so let me keep on doing it for pi plus p. Uh, the, um, the other terms, by the Landau rules, have no pole at nu squared equals mu fourth. Of course, for computing the residue at the pole, we only need the residue of the pole in this thing and the value of this vertex at the kinematic value that gives you the pole. So this could just as well be simply the Born graph with renormalized coupling constants plus other parts that have no poles. Our usual argument, the residue due of the pole is given to all orders by the contribution from lowest order perturbation theory by our renormalization conditions. But I, I want to keep these dispersion relations on the board. So I'll just erase half of this. I have, as far as the pole part goes, equals. Well, let's see. I've got two interactions, so that gives me an IG squared. I've got one propagator. I've got an I in the denominator. All of these momenta are the same. This is Q, this is Q, this is P, this is P. So the internal momentum, as I see, is uh, p minus q. I am the denominator, a u bar, an i gamma 5, 1 over p uh, minus q squared minus m squared. 
P slash minus Q slash minus a plus M. That's the Feynman propagator with the I already factored out. I gamma five U. It's the same U and the same U bar because it's forward scattering. Four I's come together to make one. One I cancels the I in front, so the pole in A pi plus P equals G squared. I drag the usual game. I drag the gamma 5 through, where it annihilates the other one, changes the sign of the P slash. So that, sorry. Drag the gamma 5 through. Gamma 5 squared is 1. Computation we've done before. P slash and Q slash change sign. Minus P slash plus M acting on a free Dirac spinner gives me 0. So I'm left with the Q slash. Um, U bar, Q slash, U. Then the denominator, I get P squared, which is M squared. That cancels. Q squared, which is mu squared, and minus 2P dot Q, which is minus nu. And just to check when I did it wrong, yeah, I got everything completely different, so <laughs> we'll just leave it like this. Now, we've got to do, obviously, we've said that this is just a number. It doesn't depend on the spin state of the initial particle, so we should be able to see that. Let's go for the moment to the frame in which uh, P is at rest. Then U bar gamma naught U is 2M. U bar gamma I U is zero, since U bar gamma mu U is uh, or is always two P mu. Oh shit! I didn't have to do that. What's the point of doing it that way? Excuse me. <laughs> that was just done. This U bar gamma mu U is two P mu. Therefore, U bar Q slash U is mu. Why did I have to do it in the rest frame when I was doing it out last night? Therefore, pole in A pi plus P is simply independent of the spin direction as predicted. G squared nu over minus nu plus over U squared minus nu. Is everyone uh, happy about the computation? Now, of course, A pi minus P is the same thing with nu replaced by minus nu. So it's minus D squared nu over U squared plus nu. Now to compute the difference, A minus over nu. I have G squared of the common factor, nu is a common factor, 1 over mu squared, 1 over nu from the definition, 1 over mu squared minus nu, plus, because there's an explicit minus sign up there, 1 <coughs> over mu squared plus nu. And by uh, some rather elementary algebra, I get uh, the news cancel. Of course, since this is supposed to be an even function, g squared times 2 mu squared over mu 4 minus mu squared. Therefore, I have deduced 
R minus equals 2 G squared mu squared period. Sorry. A minus 2 G squared mu squared because I put the sign differently in my dispersion relation. To compute our, uh, the pole in A plus over nu squared, that's the same thing. I've got a common factor of g squared nu over, now over nu squared. I have 1 over mu squared minus nu, minus 1 over mu squared plus nu. Now the mu squared cancels and the nu survives, so I get uh, 2 g squared nu squared over nu squared, which is just 2 g squared over uh, mu fourth minus nu squared. So I have r plus equals um, minus 2 g squared. Okay, unless I have made algebraic errors, of which I'm no longer confident that I haven't, since I discovered I made an error at the beginning, uh, that should be right. We have now um, uh, obtained the complete form of the dispersion relations. This is as much as we know about them, and it's as much as anyone knows about them. They enable us to compute, notice these are extraordinarily powerful statements. You may find this lecture has been dull, but we have obtained is something that's extraordinarily powerful. I wish I could give you, work out the answer, but of course, at this stage on to check them, I have to take sigma plus from experiment, do this integral numerically, and see that if it, if it re, of course, it must create the imaginary part of the amplitude correctly. It would be a real disaster if it didn't, but see if it creates the um, uh, real part of the amplitude correctly. There are relations that enable us, depending on how we look at it, to determine both the pi plus p and the pi minus p scattering amplitudes, the real part in the forward direction, the imaginary part we already have because we have the total cross-section, in terms of the imaginary part and either one or two unknown parameters. If you say you know the coupling constant, then you have one parameter to uh, determine the value of a plus at zero. If you, have, if you say you don't know the coupling constant and you want to use this as a groovy way of getting a high accuracy determination of the coupling constant, then you have two parameters, a plus of 0 and g. At any rate, they give us an infinite number of output functions in terms of experimental input in either one or two, uh, sorry, a, a function of all variables in terms of experimental, apparently unrelated experimental input and two free numerical parameters at most. Yes? It was no, because the details of the Lagrangian hardly entered. Uh, we we uh, proved it to all orders of perturbation theory, but uh, the method of proof is such that if we had a different Lagrangian, for example, uh, one with 42 other fields in it, it wouldn't have changed anything. It would have put in some extra thresholds at various points as we went up the real axis, but our curve would, the Cauchy curve would, uh, would include them. And in fact, as one might suspect for proof that is, can be proved, something that can be proved to all orders in perturbation theory, in fact, you can prove it uh, using, and from general principles, using nothing but positive, the dispersion relation or the analyticity properties, I should say, using nothing but uh, positivity of the metric in Hilbert space, uh, the existence of fields that commute at space-like separation, and the reduction formula. So in fact, it follows from the general axioms of quantum field theory, if uh, this dispersion relation turned out to be wrong, we would know that um, uh, we would really be in the soup. We would know not just that our uh, particular Lagrangian theory was wrong, we, know, we would know there would be no Lagrangian theory that could be right, nor indeed no theory based on local fields that could be right. So we also have a 
That's right. We have an assumption on the number of subtractions, which we obtain from experiment. It might be that, you are, from what we have seen so far, it might be that the dispersion relations require uh, more subtractions. For all we know, it could be that we are being misled, that beyond our energy range, the high energy cross sections begin growing like news of the 42nd, and the real part dominates the imaginary part, God knows what, and a large number of extra subtractions could be needed. Um, uh, there is, however, a famous bound, the so-called Froissart bound, which is incredibly complicated to prove on rigorous grounds, and I will not prove it here. But from the same general assumptions I gave before, plus a very intense use of partial wave decompositions, fixed T dispersion relations, and unitarity, one can show, in fact, that the total cross sections, and indeed uh, the amplitudes divided by nu, both the real and the imaginary part, cannot grow at high energies larger than log squared of nu. This doesn't say sigma plus and sigma minus two are equal. It just says that the individual amplitudes don't grow faster than log squared of nu. And if you accept that, which is equally general, those of you who took my 251 course or the past hand-waving argument coming from potential theory, you uh, believe that the, um, that the, um, then you know there are no more than two subtractions. There might be an addition to a subtraction constant in the A plus dispersion relation, an additional subtraction constant in the A minus dispersion relation, and that's it. No more. In fact, we have, a, we have rigorous information on the bounds of the number of subtractions. <clears throat> okay, I can't prove that to you here, but it's true. It has been proved, and I have read the proofs, and they are proofs. There's no... <laughs> Um, if you look these things up in the literature, frequently we'll find people normalize the amplitudes in different ways than I do, so there's some numerical factor sticking here and here. Uh, frequently they, um, they uh, choose a subtraction point in the one subtract to dispersion relation for the even amplitude to be other than the point zero. We could have divided by nu squared minus anything squared rather than zero. Uh, in fact, frequently they choose it to be uh, the threshold point in which case the form of this thing changes slightly. Instead of nu squared minus, instead of nu squared at various places, you have nu squared minus uh, four mu squared m squared. But uh, otherwise, they look the same. The advantage of choosing it at a threshold is that that's an experimentally measurable point. So instead of fitting the subtraction constant, you can measure it directly. I should also say, of course, if you only have partial information, these things are set up so that the integrals converge. But still, if you're looking at some um, value of uh, particular value of nu, of course, you need, in trying to compute the real part, you need the imaginary part out of further re much further region for much longer distance than the place at which you're trying to compute the real part, because at the place you're trying to compute the real part, the denominator is very small. And you've got to go out for quite a while, ways before you get convergence and can forget sufficient convergence so you can cut off your integral without making a grotesque error. But that's groovy because experimentally, it's at any given energy, it's always easier to measure the total cross-section than the real part of the forward scattering amplitude. So that's usually the current state of our experimental knowledge also. <laughs> I believe these have been checked out to, what, 30 BeV or so for pi P scattering? No, 30 BeV in, in, yeah, in the laboratory, yeah. For both the real and the imaginary part. We probably have gone even farther now what with, uh, um, what with uh, NAL. They fit beautifully, of course. If they didn't, I wouldn't be giving this course, right? Because then local field theory would have fallen. It's not like, uh, it's not like uh, the magnetic moment relations in SU3, where if they don't fit beautifully, you just throw away SU3. Here you have to throw, if these don't work, everything goes down the drain. Now, the, um, before leaving the forward dispersion relations, I would like to prove a famous theorem due to uh, Pomeranchuk.
Um, the theorem says it's no coincidence, it's no deep physics, in the fact that sigma plus and sigma minus go to the same value. Uh, sorry, that the pi plus p and pi minus p uh, total cross sections go to the um, same value as nu goes to infinity. There is deep physics in the fact that they fall off as nu to the minus one half. That deep physics is Reggie Pohl theory and has to do with the location of something called the road trajectory. But um, I won't talk about that here. I'll just prove Pomeranchuk's theorem, which says if one sigma pi plus Six minus p goes as nu goes to infinity to constants, possibly different constants. <coughs> uh, equivalently, this says that, uh, in particular for our purposes, the interesting thing will be that uh, at infinity, uh, a minus of nu over nu, which divides out the square root of nu squared minus 4 mu squared for large, 4 m squared mu squared for large nu, goes as nu goes to infinity. Imaginary part goes to sigma minus at infinity, a constant, the difference of the two cross sections. For large nu, the square root of the factor in the optical theorem is divided off by the nu in the denominator. And two, real part of a plus minus. All right, okay, thanks, Donald. Hey, how'd you make out over children's today? Of a pi plus minus of p is bounded, doesn't blow up as nu goes to infinity. So then, sigma minus of infinity equals zero. That is to say, if the two cross sections go individually to constants, and if the real part of the amplitude does not dominate the imaginary part of the amplitude at large uh, energies, to empirical facts, which we could imagine obtaining from independent experiments, then the two limits in the cross sections must be uh, equal. The argument is uh, perfectly general, it's, um, and uh, it holds for any case in which you can prove a, a dispersion relation, which is in a forward scat for forward scattering is practically any case. All that happens is that the location of the cut is sometimes moved around a bit by anomalous thresholds. And uh, therefore, the, um, the theorem is frequently stated that if the scattering of particle off target and the scattering of antiparticle off target both go to constants, and if the real part of the amplitude does not dominate the imaginary part at high energy, then the cr asymptotic cross section for particle off target is the same as the asymptotic cross section for antiparticle off target. Are there any questions? Yes, Martin. It grows logarithmically. I'll make a remark about that at the end of the proof. It's easier, to, it would be easy to see the answer to that once I show you how I prove it under these assumptions. Let me, um, let me interrupt the lecture for a strip tease. <laughs> have to continually write a minus of nu over nu. Our assumptions are f of nu goes as nu goes to infinity as sigma minus of infinity. And real part of f of nu over imaginary part of f of nu bounded as nu goes to infinity. Now, we don't want to assume in advance that um, sigma minus 
I beg your pardon? Imaginary, thank you. The, um, we don't want to assume that uh, so in advance the sigma minus is zero, which was the fact we used before to write an unsubtracted dispersion relation for f minus, for f. And therefore, uh, since uh, sigma minus could be non-zero, we'll have to make a subtraction in the dispersion relation for f. And thus we write uh, f of nu squared equals f of 0, say making our subtraction as 0, a possible pull term, nu squared r minus over nu squared minus mu fourth, plus integral um, 4 mu squared m squared to infinity, 1 over pi, nu squared over pi, I should say, since I'm making a subtractive dispersion relation, like the a plus one. Uh, one uh, imaginary part of f of nu prime, one over nu prime squared, d nu prime squared. I won't bother to split it up there into nu prime d nu nu prime squared minus nu squared, and with your permission, I'll drop the i epsilon because I'm tired of writing it. That is unquestionably a, um, a uh, true dispersion relation under the stated assumptions. Now, I'm going to break this up into, th I'm going to break up the integral into two terms. That's the subtraction constant, the same place the a plus of zero came from here. I've so once subtracted dispersion relation in nu squared. I cannot assume uh, a ma what? Did I make a mistake or what? Hmm? No, r comes from the pole that's already there, and then because I've written an unsubtracted dispersion relation for f over nu squared, I get a subtraction constant. The f of zero comes from the place that everything else vanishes as nu squared goes to zero. Right? Set so nu squared equals zero, this vanishes, this vanishes, f of zero equals f of zero. As above, where lambda is some, um, is some large value of nu squared, which I'll talk about, uh, in, which I'll choose in a moment. In fact, I'll choose lambda so large that I'll assume for nu squared greater than lambda, I can, with negligible error, replace imaginary part of f of nu prime by, um, by its asymptotic value, sigma minus. So I've got nu squared sigma minus over pi, integral from lambda to infinity, uh, d nu prime squared, nu prime squared, nu prime squared minus nu squared. Thus, I've written this as a sum of four terms, the fourth one of which is a trivial quadrature in which I can do exactly. However, the critical point is that all the first three terms go to constants as nu goes to infinity. The first term is manifestly a constant. The second term goes to r minus. The third term, which is the integral between this region, as nu nu is very large, I simply have an integral over a bounded region with a nu squared factor in the denominator. Therefore, the integral goes like 1 over nu squared, and there's an explicit nu squared in front, so I get a constant. What about the last term? Well, the last term I can trivially do by quadratures. It's an absolutely trivial integral. And the last term 
as you can readily see, by decomposing that product into partial fractions. I'll just write down the answer. I see that's what I did here. Last term equals sigma minus of infinity. I'm sorry, I should have put an of infinity in here, the asymptotic value, over pi log lambda squared over lambda squared minus nu squared, which goes, as nu goes to infinity, this term goes to sigma minus of infinity over pi log nu squared. That's reasonable. It's giving us the right imaginary part at infinity. Everything else has no imaginary part at infinity. This has no imaginary part. This is a pole. It has no imaginary part except at the location of the pole. This integral only has, since we're only integrating up to lambda, only has an imaginary part up to lambda. So this has got to give us all of the imaginary part at infinity, and indeed it does, because as we go from above to below the cut in the logarithm, we get a discontinuity of i pi. Yeah, we got a discontinuity of 2i pi. I dropped the 2 somewhere, but forget that. <laughs> the, uh, no, yes, that's right. We, and we get uh, sigma minus of, uh, we get a discontinuity of 2i pi, and that's twice the imaginary part. That's right. <laughs> we get a discontinuity. We get an imaginary part proportional to sigma minus. I should say log minus nu squared. <coughs> the, um, the, um, however, more interesting is that the real part blows up, like log nu squared. Now that contradicts our second assumption, that the real part over the imaginary part is bounded, because the reimaginary part is going to a constant and the real part is going like a logarithm. Therefore, contradiction unless sigma minus of infinity equals zero. I might have an overall minus sign. I might have made an error doing the integral. I still log something. <laughs> <laughs> okay. the, um, now, it's very easy to see what happens to uh, answer Martin's question of before I launched on this proof. If we have a more relaxed assumption in which we say, still assume the ratio of the real part to the imaginary part is bounded, but assume that. Uh, as nu goes to infinity, or I should say, sorry, wrote it badly. If we have, for example, sigma pi plus p, pi plus or minus or p as nu goes to infinity, goes to some constant, call it a plus or minus log nu, or it could be log nu squared. Under the same assumptions, Going through the same things, the only thing that'll change is the integral at the last stage, which will then yield a log squared rather than a logarithm, since log squared is that whose imaginary part is log. <laughs> and uh, the, uh, we would deduce a plus equals a minus, et cetera, if it were log squared or log to the 14th. The lead coefficient of the leading power of the logarithm would uh, be equal for the two cases. Okay. Yes, sir. Oh, I said I choose lambda. Lambda is chosen such that nu greater than lambda 
or I should say nu squared greater than lambda, implies equals sigma minus of infinity plus tiny error. A little, a little real analysis shows you that for this part of est for this estimate, you can replace it by its limiting value. Okay. Yes, sir. Grows more rapidly than the imaginary part. Yeah. Well, that leads us into a, into a can of worms, one that in fact has been plunged into and which truth has been extracted. What sort of things can you assume if you do not, if you do not make assumptions about the asymptotic behavior? That is to say, from the fact that it's a constant over a large range from 10 to 30 GeV, can you assume that in the range from 10 to 30 GeV, the two constants are the same? Uh, the standard tool for doing that is using the so-called Froissart bound, so you can make twice subtracted dispersion relations, uh, once subtracted dispersion relations. You know you don't have to do any more subtractions. And then using a lot of, uh, a lot of complicated estimates involving greater than or equal to's and less than or equal to's, and you can get pretty much, you can get a lot of information even if you really don't know what's happening at infinity. Okay, but that's complicated real analysis, Hardy Littlewood type estimates, and I don't want to go into it here, mainly because I couldn't reproduce it myself. I'd have to read the papers, but it can be done, and that sort of analysis has been done. You can make rely, you can make definite predictions even if you only know the scattering amplitude up to a certain point and don't know anything about how it behaves after that point, except that it can't grow too fast. Okay, that's a mess. I mean, if you actually look at the data, the fact that it is not obtaining its asymptotic value seems a preposterous statement. You know, you go on decade upon decade in energy, or proton, proton, all the way up to ISR, and you just see this tiny coefficient of a logarithmic variation, and on top of that, a constant. And it's as smooth as can be. The most remarkable fact about the intersecting storage rings is how little structure they reveal, how little new physics you find you find in things like total hadron cross sections going over decades of, uh, of center of mass energy. Decades of new, I should say, increasing new by a factor of 10. Practically nothing changes. It really looks constant. It's not one of these things where people get three points and they lie in a line. They say, ha, it's constant. <laughs> <laughs> you plot this thing, it goes on forever, OK? <laughs> Flat as Kansas. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Are there other questions? Now we're going to enter another stretch of, this concludes the applications I will give of the forward dispersion relations, or indeed a fixed momentum transfer, fixed angle dispersion relations. And I'd now like to talk a little bit about partial wave amplitudes. And do a, um, but to begin that, I would, and for a certain later purposes when we're discussing current algebra, I'd like to do the kinematics of partial wave amplitudes having nothing to do with their analyticity property, and that will be very dull, but it has to be done. You remember we had, I'll consider the scattering of two particles of the same mass, <coughs> P plus Q goes into P prime plus Q prime, and I'll give them masses. They're not necessarily the pi and the nucleon. I'll just call their masses, however, M and mu. And recall, we defined our invariant amplitude by saying if these are relativistically normalized states, and this is S minus 1, and this is P and Q, then this is uh, 2 pi to the fourth, delta 4 
of p prime plus q prime minus p minus q times i a, the invariant scattering amplitude. We also had a definition of the partial wave amplitude, al, a function of center of mass energy only, is the integral d cosine theta, pl of cosine theta, a. Now, there's also a standard non-relativistic definition of partial wave amplitudes, or indeed of partial wave phase shifts, if we assume this is a process in which no inelastic channels are open. So the eigenvalues of the S matrix are the angular momentum states, and they have eigenvalue e to the 2i delta L. The question, which we will have to fight our way through, dull as it is, is how are these ALs represented in terms of the phase shifts? We've got to make a correspondence between relativistic and non-relativistic quantum mechanics. If when we get done with all of this, we're going to say, oh, here is a prediction for a scattering length, which is defined in terms of phase shifts. So that is the dull kinematics, which I propose to do. The first step is to change these things to non-relativistically normalized states. So we have consistent normalization. That's easy enough. I'll put arrows on them. You can do the same thing in your notes. <laughs> There's 1 over 2 pi to the 3 halves for each state square root. So that's 1 over 2 pi to the 6 product over all incoming and outgoing particles of 1 over twice the energy. The second stage is to go to the center of mass frame. The center of mass frame is defined by I take these two momentum to be opposite. Same operator inside. I take this one uh, to be equal to P and this one to be equal to Q. And this is supposed to be a factor that tells you energy and momentum, uh, the momentum is conserved. Delta cubed of P plus Q. They've got to have the same momentum. And then there's a leftover factor, which we call this reduced or center of mass scattering amplitude. That is a function. Sorry, I should have called this P prime and P prime plus Q. P prime, P center of mass. That's how you define the center of mass scattering amplitude, which is a function only of one incoming momentum, the momentum of either incoming particle in the center of mass frame, and one outgoing momentum. Yeah, you factor out this factor using the energy momentum conserving properties of the S matrix. Comparing this equation with this equation, we see that by the standard definition, the three-dimensional part of the delta function is where it should be. The four-dimensional part is left. So we have P prime S minus 1, P in the center of mass frame equals 2 pi to the minus 2 product 1 over twice the energy delta of E1 plus E2 minus E1 prime minus E2 prime. That's left over. That's not in the definition. There's an explicit delta function saying it conserves energy in the center of mass frame times, of course, I A. OK, any questions about that? That's going to the center of mass frame, just using the standard definition of the center of mass frame. Now, we also have the definition of A. And from the um, no normalization properties of the Legendre polynomials, we can write A is, can be reconstructed in terms of the Legendre polynomials. It's sum L equals 0 to infinity. AL, PL of cosine theta, 
times a factor 2L plus 1 over 2. That's just the normalization of the Legendre polynomials. The integral of, two of the square of a Legendre polynomial over all cosine theta is 2 over 2L plus 1. You have to know that fact. I'm sorry. If you, wanted, <laughs> if you wanted a derivation of it, you should have taken physics 251, where I derived all this. Yeah. We're now in a position where we just have to go to a non-relativistic quantum mechanics book and look up the S matrix in terms of P and P prime, in terms of non-relativistically normalized, normalizable states. It couldn't actually find that formula in any given non-relativistically, non-relativistic quantum mechanics book. They always talk about the scattering amplitude, and I can never remember how that's connected to the S matrix. But what I did find was the expansion of a state in terms of angular momentum eigenstates. And I knew the, S, either the phase shift was defined, either 2i delta L was the eigenvalue of the S matrix. So I plugged that in and did a little algebra. The book I used was Gottfried, but that hardly matters. <laughs> and I found the following formula, which should in some form or another look familiar to you. <laughs> equals 0 to infinity. I, good thing that's there, 2L plus 1 over 2 pi P squared, as usual, less the magnitude of either momentum. PL of cosine theta, E the I delta L sine delta L. We all remember that, I hope, although we may not remember the things that delta of p prime minus p. I wrote it in this form with the delta of p prime minus p rather than the delta of e prime minus e, which is the form you may usually find things in books for a very good reason. Delta of e prime minus e is based on the fact that e equals k squared over 2m, which is in general not true in relativistic quantum mechanics. If I write it in terms normalized with respect to p and write it as delta of p prime minus p, I'm, all I'm really using is the Euclidean transformation properties of the theory. That's how you get from an angular momentum from a momentum eigenstate to an angular momentum eigenstate, which doesn't have anything to do with the dynamics. It may be Galilean, or it may be Lorentz invariant, or maybe some god-awful mess. It doesn't matter. So this form is just the definition of an angular momentum state. <coughs> OK. This is, now, of course, up here, we have an energy-conserving delta function, not a p-conserving delta function. But of course, they're the same thing. So oh, important point. This is for indistinguishable particles. If I have distinguishable part, if I, this is for distinguishable particles, I'm sorry. If I have identical particles, identical spinless particles, I'm always talking about spinless particles here for simplicity. There is a multiplicative factor. Does everyone remember that? I see some people do not. It's been too long since you took non-relativistic quantum mechanics. Where does the time 2 come from? It comes from the fact that for identical bosons in the center of mass state, a momentum eigenstate is not represented by e to the i k dot x, but e to the i k dot x plus e to the minus i k dot x over root 2. That ex just expresses the fact that you can't tell separation x from separation of minus x. The, um, the root 2 gives you a 1 half, but the fact that you have two factors on each side gives you a 4. And the combination of the 1 half and the 4 gives you a 2. <laughs> and of course, only even L's occur. All right? It's again, it's the same story. Now, <laughs> the, um, now, the last stage in making our comparison and figuring out what the ALs are, a very dull operation, but thank God it's only taken us 15 minutes, is that our usual elementary kinematics, I see I did this in a different order than I did here, 
tells us that if we turn the energy delta function into a momentum delta function, by the usual tricks, I think I'll spare you the algebra since people are yawning right and left. <laughs> one can obtain P prime S minus one P in the center of mass frame equals two pi to the minus two IA um, Oh, I wrote it all together, I'm sorry. I'll write it all together and leave it for you to check. IA 16 pi squared P E1 plus E2 delta of P prime minus P. That's just the usual game of turning an energy conserving delta function into a momentum conserving delta function. And I've also used the fact that because of the presence of the energy conserving delta functions, these energies in the denominator in the center of mass frame are equal pairwise. Get rid of the square roots and turn them into solid integral powers. Now I'm now in a position where I can use this formula and this formula and compare it with this formula and see how things are connected. Okay. Now the PL plus cosine, PL and cosine theta, and the 2L plus 1 are in the same place in both things, so I don't have to worry about them. The I is in the same place in both things. So here I have 1 over 32 in the 1 half here, pi squared, P, E1 plus E2, which I'll write as root S, that's the center of mass energy. AL, that's this factor here. That's the coefficient of PL cosine theta, 2L plus 1 I on one side. On the other side, I have E the I delta L, sine delta L, 1 over 2 pi P squared. Sticking these things together, I find my final grotesque formula. But I'm sorry, boys, that's the way in girls. That's the way it comes out. 16 pi root s over p e to the i delta l sine delta l. And of course, times 2 if identical bosons. The only question of why of you can possibly ask is why did I bother to do explicitly a computation so boring? <laughs> but <laughs> if there are other questions, please ask them now. Yes? No, it's over both the final and initial state. And then the square roots disappear because the energy of the initial proton must be the same as the energy of the final proton and the energy of the initial uh, pi on also. Over, in, and out. Now, this has, um, uh, two results. One is we have a very simple meaning to the uh, total amplitude evaluated at threshold. You re it is connected to the scattering length. I remind you what the scattering length is. Um, limit p goes to 0, e v i delta naught sine delta naught over p is defined to be minus a naught, the scattering length. The scattering length is what dominates low energy scattering because low energy scattering has got to be S wave. You can't have any direction because at threshold the momentum vanishes. So what establishes a direction? <laughs> 
we can see that the scat from these formulas, by plugging that into these formulas, and, uh, well, plugging it into the formula for AL and cranking through. Again, I will not bother you with the cranking through. That A, evaluate, I'll now write it down explicitly, M plus mu squared, the only physical value of T allowable at threshold, T equals zero, equals minus 8 pi times 2 for identical particles. Thus, people who do the um, subtractions and their forward dispersion relations at threshold, you will sometimes see written underneath there where there is a mysterious constant. And they say, where this constant is the pi on nucleon scattering length. And you look at that and you say, what? I was doing things in the forward direction. I was following this paper. What is this angular momentum concept doing there? That's what it's doing there. It is the value of the amplitude at threshold, aside from kinematic factors. I should remark that this is also valid if the particles have spin, because near threshold, on account of there is no momentum available in the center of mass frame, no three momentum, it is impossible, the only, there is no angular momentum, and therefore spin is conserved in scattering at threshold, although it may not be conserved elsewhere. So you could again use this formula, the amplitude will have to be diagonal in the total incoming spin and the total outgoing spin, and then you define a scattering length that is spin, depends on the total spin. Thus, for example, in nucleon-nucleon scattering, there is a spin 1 scattering length and a spin 0 scattering length, and they are given by this formula with taking the, appropriate sp the, um, the amplitude among appropriate spinners at threshold. That was extremely dull. That's the end of the dull part. We now get to more interesting stuff, but we need these formulas for later purposes, so I thought this was a good time to derive them. Okay, is everyone, everyone who is not asleep is happy, and those who are asleep, I presume, have nice dreams. <laughs> now, I want to make a key observation about this object. And its consequences. Let's consider, for example, pi pi scattering fixed L, a partial wave amplitude. This is the analyticity domain we established for AL. It looks something like this, with a cut here beginning at threshold, i.e. at P equals 0, and a cut here, a left-hand cut beginning at S equals 0. The value up here was AL. The value down here was AL conjugated, just like for the forward scattering amplitude for the same reasons. Now, um, E to the I delta L sine delta L we see has exactly the same analyticity properties. The kinematic factors, P and root S, don't bother us. Of course, they put in new cuts, but they're new cuts at exactly the same locations that are old cuts. If I define the square root properly, P has a cut beginning at P equals 0. It's the square root of S minus 4 mu squared. And S has a cut, the square root of S has a cut beginning at S equals 0. But we've already got a cut beginning at S equals 0. So E to the I delta L sine delta L has exactly the same cut plane analyticity properties as does um, AL. And indeed, so does SL which is equal to e to the 2i delta L, because that can be obtained by elementary algebra from e to the i L delta L delta L, sine delta L. So I could draw another plane over here, which is in fact the same plane. And up here is SL, and it has the same analyticity properties. What happens when we go below the cut, though? What about the Schwartz reflection properties? 
Now things get interesting. Um, AL complex conjugates, okay, uh, show that that means that delta L changes sign. Why is that? Well, if delta L changes sign, that complex conjugates this factor. That puts a minus sign in this factor, but I've also got a minus sign in P, since P is a square root function in the S-plane. And when I go from above the cut in P to below the cut in P, around the point P equals zero, I get a minus sign. So those two minus signs cancel each other out, one coming from the factor of P and one from the change of sign here. So delta L changes sign, and SL also has the same Schwartz reflection principles as AL. Okay, it's important that the kinematics worked out that way because we're going to see is going to be critically important, as we'll see at the beginning of next lecture, maybe if you'll allow me to run five minutes over at the very end of this one, that the fact that SL above the cut is the complex conjugate of SL below the cut makes a lot of physics run that wouldn't run otherwise. Is the kinematics clear to everyone? The extra minus sign you get for the sign cancels out the extra minus sign you get from the P. This ends the, I will state and use, but not prove, the situation that prevails in the multi-channel case. We have proved these scattering analyticity properties only for pi pi scattering. I will state now the properties that prevail in the general case, which you can see are reasonable generalizations of this, although I shall not prove them. Elastic, but no, uh, no three-body final states. I will break the particle state up into states of fixed energy and angular momentum and the fine SL, again, which is now a matrix, depending on how many channels are open. Pi plus n goes into pi, pi minus, uh, goes into pi naught p, et cetera, several channels. Therefore, I have a genuine matrix, SL, that's a function of little s. In the little s plane, this obeys cut plane analyticity. There will be a right-hand cut that might begin lower than you think with various abnormal thresholds and so on. There'll be a left-hand cut that may come in closer than you think. There may be bound state poles. There may be other exotica floating around here for certain kinematic configurations. As you see, we won't need to worry about them in our argument. Above the cut, this thing a matrix. Below the cut, this thing I assert and will not prove to you is SL adjoint. That is to say, the value of the matrix above the cut and the value of the matrix below the cut are adjoints. This is the obvious generalization of the statement that they are complex conjugates in the single channel case, which I have proof for you, and it happens to be the true statement. Now, I know why I raised the L there, just to confuse you, I think. Now, I am going to study the behavior of this function from my known information about its analyticity properties. Those of you who took 251 will realize that we're shortly getting into a rerun of a 251 lecture, but where I've used the same analyticity properties, which are also true in potential scattering. And the rule of thumb. The rule of thumb I'm going to use is that a function of a complex variable in a region where it's analytic is slowly varying. That is to say, its range of variation is determined by the characteristic lengths of the problem. If, there are, if the region is small and there are no singularities nearby, can expand it in the Taylor series, convergent in that small region. We'd expect the successive terms in this Taylor series to be down by whatever the characteristic mass of the problem is by dimensional analysis. 
1 over m pi squared or 1 over m nucleon squared or whatever, and therefore in a small region, small compared to the characteristics, dimensions of the problem, we would expect it to be sensible to approximate the function by a constant. We'd expect the function to wrap very rapidly only if it's near a singularity. So that is our rule of thumb. In a small region of analyticity, it is sensible to approximate a function of a complex variable by a constant. Okay? I say it as a rule of thumb. It's obviously not a rigorous mathematical theorem. Any idiot can perform a, can produce a counterexample, but nevertheless, it is a reasonable rule. When do you expect things to vary rapidly? Well, if you're on top of a pole or a cut, of course, yes, but otherwise, no. <clears throat> I'm going to use this rule of thumb to study the variation of this function, which may have all sorts of cuts down here as real channel, new channels open up, along the top of the real axis. Now, at first glance, that seems crazy because um, there I am on top of a cut. And so how can I find a region of anal a small region of analyticity? It stops, right? That's the point there. However, I'm going to show you that you can continue this function through the cut. And I'll explicitly develop a formula for the continuation. Therefore, let me sketch my complex S-plane again. It's a clever argument due to Kurt Zemancic. Here's the complex S-plane. There may be all sorts of left-hand singularities. They're irrelevant. Here's the right-hand cut. It may have all sorts of different thresholds in it, but I'm assuming I'm well above them. I'm in a region like here. Somewhere up here, three particle channels open up. I'm going to ignore that. Or rather, I'm going to assume I'm in some region between here and here. Now, I have this function SL, capital S. It's a matrix. And the one thing I know about the function is that its value above the cap is the adjoint of its value above the cut, below the cut. And I also know by my kinematic assumptions, since I'm counting all the two-particle channels, and the three-particle channels have not opened up yet, SL minus 1. That is to say, in this region, the only states available are two-particle states. And therefore, this is the whole S matrix for states of a fixed angular momentum, and the whole S matrix is unitary. Its adjoint is its inverse. Is it inverse no, the physical thing, oh, sorry, forgive me, adjoint. OK. It's equivalent to what you said, and I will now establish the equivalence, SL of S minus I epsilon. is uh, SL inverse. Is that the way I want to do it? No, I want to put the inverse on the other side. Obtained by applying these two, putting together these two equations and taking the inverse. Now, I will now show you how I will find a second sheet. Since there are many branch points, what I mean by the second sheet, of course, depends on where I go. I want to go down here. OK, what would be the analog of extending this thing to a second sheet? Well, I would extend it to a second sheet if I had a second S-plane which may have the same singularities in it or some others. And in the second sheet, S-plane, I define a function, which meromorphic function, which is rotating around in it, mixing around it which I'll call SL2, extended on the second sheet. And it must have the property that SL2 of S minus I epsilon equals SL in the first sheet of S plus I epsilon. That is to say, the value up here should be the same as the value down here. If the values are the same along this line, 
then I can stick things together. I analytically continue up to this point. By declaration, I go on to the second sheet, which doesn't change anything by this equation. And then I wander around the second sheet, finding whatever singularities I have. Okay. That is the state. If I have two complex functions in the cut S plane, with SL and SL2 connected by this relation, then I can patch the two things together to make a Riemann surface going through here and out here. Is everyone happy with that statement? That is the condition that I can stick things together. What I've got up here is what I've got down here, so I just patch at that point. But between SL, the original function, define the sheet. S, S, yes. I may find a different sheet if I go beyond above another branch line. That's familiar behavior with complex variables. Now, but now it's very easy to find a function that does this because we got it. <laughs> SL inverse is, after all, a meromorphic function, if SL is. It's just rearranging the matrix elements and dividing by the determinant. Therefore, we go right, we well, may have poles where the determinant of S vanishes, but other than that, everything is OK. Therefore, we have a continuation into the second sheet. You simply take the inverse matrix, and that's the continuation onto the second sheet, meaning the second sheet you reach when you go between S1 and S2. Is everyone happy with that? Now, what sort of singularities can we encounter on the second sheet? Well, we're just computing the inverse of a meromorphic function. If there are bound state poles on the first sheet, there won't be any bound state poles on the second sheet because the inverse of a pole is a 0. And a 0 ain't a singularity. If there are cuts on the first sheet, there'll be cuts on the second sheet because if a function is discontinuous, its inverse is also discontinuous. There won't be any essential singularities or natural boundaries or any other of the god-awful pathology of analytic function theory in the way of new singularities on the second sheet because there aren't any on the first sheet. And the inverse of an essential singularity is an essential singularity. The only possible thing we can find on the first second sheet that wasn't there on the first sheet is a pole. Because if we have a 0 on the first sheet, a 0 is perfectly analytic, a 0 of the determinant, I should say, and its inverse is a pole, which is a singularity. So the drawing looks like this. Up on the first sheet, here's the analyticity domain. Down on the second sheet, here's the analyticity domain. It looks exactly the same, except there may be poles distributed around here somewhere, someplace that correspond to zeros on the first sheet. Okay. That's it. There ain't nothing more. All we can find are poles. Whether they're single poles or double poles or triple poles, I don't know. It depends on whether they're single zeros, double zeros, or triple zeros. But all we're ever going to find are poles. Um, if we define um, the function only uh, below that line there or above, you know, I mean, how do you define the above it? Do you mean, um, you just analytically? Analytically continue. As you see, this is two-sheeted. I go around here and I arrive at the inverse value by the same arguments as before, which fits in with the value here below the cut. So this particular cut is a two-sheeted cut, although that's not going to be relevant to my future analysis. If I go all the way around here, I end up back down here again. It's like a square root branch point. Yeah. If that's irrelevant, I don't want to go any further in the Riemann surface. That'll take me too far from the physical region. I just want to go below here. Now. We're now in a position. I give a microscopic close-up of the cut. Here's S1, here's S2. Okay, That's an enlargement. I take a region, some circular region, that I assume is small compared to the characteristic variation of the function, and sticks into the second sheet, slides underneath. OK, that's mechanical drawing convention. That dotted vertex means I've slid onto the second sheet. Inside the circle, I have a region of analyticity unless I find poles inside the region. 
Here's a pole. I draw it with dashed x's. Here's two of them, because they've all got to be down there below on the second sheet. Therefore, if um, there are no poles in this region, by my rule of thumb, since the region is small, I expect my function to be slowly varying. Therefore, I'll have no rapid variation in the scattering amplitudes, no wiggles or bumps in the total cross-section. On the other hand, if I do encounter a pole, then I will have possibly a wiggle or rapid variation, and I will have a wiggle or bump in the cr total cross-section. Next lecture, I will give a complete classification of all possible wiggles or bumps that can occur in the total cross-section as a consequence of picking a region in which you have second sheet poles nearby. We shall see that this will give us a complete classification, a complete zoology, if you will, or morphology, of resonances. Because this is what is normally called resonance poles or unstable particle poles. Before I let you go, I should say that this, we already had one description of where resonance poles, which were poles on the second sheet of the propagator, came last semester in our theory of unstable particles. The theory we will get this way will be, complement, will be complementary to the theory we have gotten the other way, or supplementary, I should say, since there is a region of overlap. Our other theory depended on perturbation theory. Originally, there was a stable particle. The kinematics allowed it to decay. So our other theory was a theory for fundamental particles that decayed as a result of a weak interaction. On the other hand, this is a theory for anything. This pole could be caused by a fundamental particle decaying as a result of a small perturbation, or it could be caused by dynamics that wants to make a bound state but isn't quite strong enough, so makes an almost bound state an unstable particle. So in that sense, the theory we are going to develop next lecture is more general than the theory we developed last semester. On the other sense, it is less general because the theory we developed last semester did not depend in any particular way upon their only being in using two-particle unitarity, being below the three-particle cut. And <coughs> this theory will depend critically, indeed has already depended critically, on being below the three-particle cut. So the two theories are complementary, but of course they must agree in their mutual region of overlap, and we will see next lecture that they do.